Welcome to First in Fiction, your first stop for learning to write great fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of the Hand of Adonai series, The Bargain, and First in Fiction. And I'm Alton Gansky, the other guy, uh, author of over 40 books, uh, fiction and nonfiction. You caught me drinking my tea. Oh, I thought you were going to go on more, maybe throw out some titles or something. But uh, Well, you know, I <laughs> that's what I was aiming for. Actually, yeah. froze up there for a second, so we didn't even get to see you spill your tea. Oh, you didn't? No, no. You have to do it again for us. Maybe, maybe I could do the. Maybe I should do a spit take. <laughs> yeah, Miami Dolphins Cup. Yeah, yeah. Well, you need to do oh. me a favor, and you need to beat Denver this week. Uh, you know what? Uh, I'll do my best on that one. Uh, we we did beat uh, we beat the Chargers. So is that is it too soon? You need to do a favor for me, and that is beat Denver this week to okay. make up for beating my Chargers. To make but amends. enough of that. This, you know what? We'll just edit all this out, and this will all end up on the cutting room floor. You see, you, you see that transition there? Uh, quite that was, the transition. That was gold right there. So, <laughs> well, excellent. We're glad you guys could join us. Uh, we are talking about editing today. We're doing some self-editing. Uh, I thought about. Uh, calling it elf editing and making it a Christmas special, but uh, I just didn't want to wait, and uh, I didn't want to put on the funny Santa hat. So uh, self-editing it is. You've heard, I'm sure, some other episodes that we've done uh, in this vein, uh, but we've got uh, Al with us, my dad, who's the author of 40-something books, as he said. Uh, so he's got a, a kind of a tried-and-true process that seems to work for him and, and uh Comparing our notes, we're actually very similar. So, uh, you broke it down, pops into a couple different areas that you look at when you're going back through a manuscript. Um, and one of the first things that you look at is character. Right. These come from um, editing. I sometimes I'm called upon to uh, edit someone else's work. A publisher will hire me to uh, do line editing primarily uh, and the macro editing, sometimes called substantive editing. And uh, over the years, uh, I've noticed certain faults that keep popping up, and so I started making a list of them. And the real benefit uh, to me was uh, it helps me keep from making the same mistakes because we all do them. They're just it's just part of writing. There's so much material that goes in, uh, but I found that by listing them and uh, reviewing it from time to time, I make fewer uh, of these faults than uh, if I just ignored them. Or as in my early days of writing, I didn't even know the there were such things, such critters. So, yeah, you know, I, and I think that's an important distinction that we need to make, which is that this is, at least for for me, editing is something you do after the first draft is done. Um, I really believe that there are two modes of the brain. One is creative. One is a little more, I guess, kind of logical. And when you're in that creative mode of finishing the first draft, I think, at least for me, and you can speak on this, uh, for me it's really important to finish, uh, just to push through. I know I have mistakes. I, I embrace the fact that I have mistakes. I know I have some really lazy prose. I know I've got some cliches in there, and I know I'm going to clean them up on my second pass. But while I'm creating and moving the story forward, I don't want to. I don't want to stop and switch gears. It's really hard for me to switch into an editing mode and then... Um, kind of get sync back into the creation mode. D is your process kind of similar? It's it's very similar. I tend to edit as I go. Um, there's there's people like Dean Koontz who's famous for saying that uh, he writes one page over and over and over until it is just the way he wants it. Uh, when it's perfect, and he may have gone over it 20 times, then he'll start page two, and he'll do that, then page three, and I would be in the loony bin uh, because I think it for me it would hold up the story. It doesn't for him, and he's proven that, so it works for him. And that's really the key in this, find out what works for you. But I do think you're on the money with this, is that there's, for most of us, our brains work differently when we're in creative mode than when we're in analytical mode. And so I find that the for most writers, the best thing to do is get your story down. And after you have some experience, you might want to edit as you go. Uh, but... Get uh, get your story down, and then you can go back and edit because they're very different processes. The third approach uh, that some will use is they will edit the previous day's work. They do it for two reasons. Uh, it's still somewhat fresh in their mind, but it also puts them back in the story. So let's say you write a chapter on Monday. 
the first thing you do on Tuesday is read that chapter, uh, fix whatever you see there, and then move into chapter two. Others, uh, I'm thinking of one particular writer, uh, she starts at the beginning and just races through the whole thing. And she knows she's when she's done, she's got 75% of a, a very bad book, but the story's there. Then she goes back and does what she considers the real writing, and that's uh, the editing, not just of prose, but of story and everything else. Yeah, it, it's funny that you mention, you know, you, if you write something on Monday, you look at it Tuesday. I, it, it's just funny because one of my characters in the book that I'm working on currently is named Monday, and so... And I, I am going back, and I, I've got the first draft done, so now when I'm going back in the second draft and cleaning things up and revising things, it's like, oh, I wrote this on Monday. But everything I wrote was on Monday. Monday yeah. uh, enough of that. All right, well, speaking of the first, my character Monday, the first thing that you've got mentioned here uh, in, in the notes is the character. So when you're editing, looking at character, there's a, there's a few things that you look for specifically and then so if you want to talk about those and then I'll jump in with what I look for with characters. Sure I think I sent uh, three of the most common ones that I've experienced uh, when I'm doing editing and uh, also from the mistakes and uh, stuff that I've made. Here's the, the problem when we're writing uh, we see the action we see the characters they're very very close to us and so we often forget just to do some of the basic stuff such as uh, uh, description and often what I see uh, in other people's manuscripts is there's missing key descriptions. Um, we don't know anything about an individual. Your character Monday, you know, we need to know whether he's mm -hmm. he's tall or he's short or he's heavy. Is he uh, intelligent? Is he dumb as a brick? What's what's the deal with him? Right. So a certain amount of information needs to be seeded in those early uh, scenes with him so that we uh, can get a character uh, image of him in our mind. And so often, missing key descriptions. So when you go through the edit, you look at it, and you first meet your character and say, okay, did I, I give enough information for this particular scene? And as I go on, do I give more information as we develop the story? Uh, some of us forget that. I did a book, and I think I was 300 pages into it when I realized I'd given no physical description of my character. Yeah, I could see him. I don't know why no one else could, but it, it finally occurred to me that I had uh, I had to look up his hair for some reason. I can't remember now the reason for it, but uh, then I realized I don't think I knew what color his hair was or that I'd ever mentioned it. And so, and I hadn't. I had to go back and uh, put a line in here and there as we do that. The second one I have are emotion faults. That's where there's missing or the reverse of that, overcooked emotions where we just go way over the top um, and the emotions and that just really draws a, a story down. Missing emotion, I read a, a manuscript one time and uh, a wife sees, his, sees her husband blown up in a car and her response is to walk back in the house. And, you know, you, you, what, what? what? There's got to be some kind of emotional response here. You know, you don't go put in a chicken pot pie in the oven and think about what you're seeing, there's going to be a response. And the author just left out all of that for some reason. Now she later went back and put it in and, you know, having well, do you Do you think it was seeing the husband cooked in the car that reminded her that the pot pie was burning? Could have been. Yeah, it could so. have been. Oh, oh, I left something in the oven. Uh, yeah. you, <laughs> see, you see one burning chicken and it reminds you of another burning chicken. Sure. Oh, okay. And the reverse of that, he said, trying to get this back on track, um, <laughs> is where we just go nuts on the emotions. Uh, and they're either overly dramatic, uh, they're, uh, <laughs> uh, especially see this in, in romances and stuff where they're, you expect the character to put a the back of their hand to their forehead and say, alas and alack. Um, and it's just unrealistic. So are they honest emotions and do you give enough? You don't have to go over the top. The reader's smart enough to know what the emotion is and will fill in. Uh, but don't skip the emotion. We have to have physical description, emotional description, uh, uh, scenic description, and description of the action going on there. One of the things that you, that you mention a lot that is, um, I think, real helpful in that regard, talking about this kind of purple prose or this melodrama specifically talking about emotions and her tears fell like rain, and you see that you know so often... Um, if you're telling somebody that your character is sad, uh, they're likely to not believe it. Whereas if you're showing that they're sad without saying that they're sad, 
it's going to be a lot more impactful. And so uh, I like how you say that that emotions, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but emotions are physical responses to outside stimuli, right? Exactly. So, yeah, so there's some sort of outside stimulus that affects us physically. And so I tell my students, you want to focus on the physical aspects of the emotion. What do you physically feel like when you're sad? And so trying to latch on to the, the drop of the stomach or the fisting of the stomach, the tightening of the stomach, or um, you know the, the heart skipping a beat, which is again cliche, but trying to find new ways to explain that, uh, those physical descriptions, without having to simply say they were sad, they were fearful, they were excited, whatever the case may be. So that's definitely one thing that I look for. Am I being too telling in my description of their characters? Rather, I also look for... Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, rather than showing, and I think part of the problem comes uh, because we don't understand what emotion is, uh, most of us, and what we do is we do, uh, uh, tend to think of it as something that is insubstantial, ethereal, you can't uh, pick it up, you know, it's just something you feel, but the word itself, emotion, is uh, two words, E from the Greek meaning in, uh, it would have been in in the Greek, E-N, epsilon nu, and uh, now I'm just going too far off the... <laughs> Forget. Anyway, it's in motion. That is, it's motion within is, is what emotion means. And it's something that's physical. So we hear love, you know, you get that ooey-gooey feeling in your stomach. You know, or uh, if, if you've ever been around someone who's seen a, a tragedy uh, or get a word that something horrible has happened to someone they love, <clears throat> often what they do is they bend over. They put their hands on their knees. They bend over and they, they struggle for breath. It's a physical uh, response. It's a punch in the gut. And so that's what you do when you're punched in the gut, you bend over. Um, mm -hmm. So I think all emotion ought to be described in some physical way. We don't say she felt sad, we show that she's sad or angry. Um, if, if somebody throws a plate, if a wife throws a plate at a husband, uh, you don't have to say she's mad. Uh, okay, she was angry. <laughs> oh, oh, is that? Oh, I thought she was practicing her discus. And probably angry at the plate, you know. Certainly could be angry at a husband. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we don't need to tell, we need to show. So I think you're spot on with that one. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I that's one thing that I find myself doing a lot is, uh, you know, I'll find some moments that are telling and I'll try and, you know, take them out. One thing that I do is I overuse the same description, which is something to always be aware of, Um you know, trying to find not only cliches, but what you're, you know, what I turn into my own cliches, my own personal cliches. I try and clear those up too. And am I using the same description too many times? That I find that uh, for me, that's something that I often have to deal with. So uh, I also look for consistency in character. Are my character actions consistent with their personality type? So is this? Uh, you get a lot of times. There's there's one thing that breaks a story for most readers, and that's where a character does something that is completely contradictory mm. to you know who they are as a person and who you've established them to be and so that breaks a story for the reader a lot of times because there's there's no reason for a character to do that now on that same coin I also like to have my characters do something that surprises me as a writer and the reason I do that is because I genuinely believe that if we as the writer know everything about our characters the reader will also know everything about our characters and there will be no surprise and if there is no surprise there's often very little reason for us to keep reading we can already predict what's going to happen so I like to have my characters surprise me in some way whether it's something that they say that alludes to some sort of mysterious past um, I like to keep myself guessing as a writer and usually by the time I finish my first draft I've realized what that is um, I realize what that surprise is and it helps me understand my characters in a way I didn't previously understand them and really helps to take the characters from this stock description, kind of this archetypical, uh, just playing a part kind of a th role into more of a leading role, into a real flesh and blood kind of person that's a little more, a little easier to imagine, a little easier for the, uh, for the readers to relate with. Right, right. Excellent. So, you, uh, your next one here is setting and scene. So, what do you do with uh, when you're looking at the setting and the scene? Well, as we've we've talked about before, and it probably <laughs> should be repeated in uh, every podcast, 
is you, you really don't have any drama or action if you don't have a scene. All plays take place in front of a, a backdrop. Movies take place at, at, at scenes. So those things need to be established uh, because that's where the action is going to take place. And I once did a, uh, a, a review. A publisher had hired me to review the second book of a New York Times bestselling author. Um, and it was the, the first one was a fluke. <laughs> Uh, but I'm, I'm reading this, and <clears throat> a lot of action takes place in a cave beneath a mansion. And I'm fine with that. But there's a scene where somebody jumps up on a ledge. And I remember stopping thinking, there's a ledge? And I go back and I look and there's no ledge. I failed to describe the scene in which this took place. Now, if you watch television and movies, they do these things called establishing shots, which is really the next thing on the list here. And an establishing shot tells the viewer where you are. Uh, so uh, a few days ago, we watched a couple of old X File uh, episodes, and Chris Carter, who I think was directing those uh, during that time, or whoever the director was, uh, anytime they showed the FBI headquarters in Washington D.C., you knew that's where you were. So there would be this short second and a half, two second shot of the exterior of the FBI building in Washington D.C., and the, then it's a fast cut to an interior shot with Mulder and Scully talking, and you know they're inside that building. You don't have to tell them that. Well, in writing, you don't get to do that visually, but you do have to set the scene. Uh, have they returned to a, a house you've already described? Okay, well, the reader needs to know that. Uh, are you someplace new where that your protagonist has never been? Then there's going to be more detail because the protagonist is trying to figure it out. So we need those establishing shots too. So it's either a uh, missing scene, a uh, missing stage, uh, or uh, there's a missing establishing shot, so we confuse. We don't know what it, where we are when we're reading this. And then the, the third one I had on there was a missing scene break. That's where you switch scenes, and so you're at one place, and then in the next paragraph you're someplace else, and that's very jarring. Uh, that's why we use hiatus breaks, those little white lines that separate scenes. Uh, in your manuscript, usually you use three asterisks. Uh, the publisher puts in a little dingbat, some kind of little... Uh, cutesy image to separate them. So you know there's been either a change in time, a change in place, um, or some other change that require a uh, change of point of view, and uh, that tells the reader that uh, there's there's been that change, and they expect some more information rather than trying to figure out how in the world did we get from Washington D.C. to Los Angeles in one line. Yeah, it's a fast plane. It's a real fast plane. Right. All right. You know, the, the, you can get a lot of mileage out of the way scenes have changed also, especially if a uh, character is coming back to some place they haven't been in a while. Mm -hmm. um, you get a lot of, you get essentially double points, right, for describing something that's changed because you have to say it was originally like this and now it's like this. And that's a real good exercise to go through if you struggle with setting and establishing setting. Go through and imagine things that have changed. What has changed exactly, and what is the effect on the character? And the other thing that you also want to look for when you're when you're looking at elements of of setting specifically is uh, what's on the stage. If if this is going to be a stage play, you have to make sure that you're putting the props in the scene. And the, the guns over the mantle are going to have to eventually come off, but we're going to have to see the guns on the mantle before they can come off the mantle. So there's a lot of work that you want to do, and if anything is coming off the stage or going on the stage uh, because it's important to the scene, you know, those things should be established. Absolutely. Yeah, otherwise your reader's saying, what gun? What mantle? And uh, that breaks the, the fictive dream, and uh, some readers just don't come back. They... They don't want to put a lot of effort into trying to figure out what it is you mean. And I'll see this when I'm, I'm talking to new writers, and I'll say, I don't, I don't understand what's going on here. Oh, what I mean is this. And I have to tell them, well, you're not going to be there with every reader. So don't tell me what you mean. Show me what you mean. Put it in the page. And uh, they sometimes get a little huffy about that. But you're not going to be there in the living room of every reader. Uh, yeah. So you have to put it on the page some way or another. I agree, and it's one thing that I do say in probably every podcast is the importance of setting. I consistently say 
that a love story in New York is not a love story in Chicago, is not a love story in Los Angeles. The setting and the characters are inextricable. And so if you are not establishing your setting, you're not also not establishing your character, at least not fully. Uh, one thing to ask yourself is not only where is your character, but how do they perceive their setting? What effect does the setting have on you or on that character? Um, different places are, I mean, for example, if I'm out in the middle of a, a snowstorm, I'm probably pretty happy. I like the cold. I like the snow. This is a good place for me to be, you know, if, as long as I'm close to home and I can go inside and have a fire in the fireplace. And Whereas, uh, I'll, I'll give you this example. Early on when my wife and I first started dating, I had an offer, the uh, a possible employment opportunity at Microsoft in Washington. And I mentioned to my wife, or my girlfriend at the time, Naomi, I said, hey, I'm thinking about maybe looking on to get in a job with Microsoft in Washington. What do you think about Washington? She said, I'd really miss you. <laughs> you know, that that kind of solidified my decision. You know, um, she jokes that she's solar powered. She, you know, if there, and man, if there, if there are clouds in front of the sun, she is grumpy. She's my human barometer. Like, if she wakes up grumpy, I know it's going to be a good day for me because it's out, it, it's overcast, and it might rain. So, like, if she wakes up grumpy, it's probably good for me, but not so good for her. It's just kind of the differences. How does the setting affect your character? Yeah, that's interesting. As soon as you said that, I thought, oh, so we're back to um, the emotion now, and uh, which I'm going to miss you, and then how your heart drops, and uh, that sort of thing. So I, I see my... Yeah. My little uh, lower third's missing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Did it go missing again? Well, we'll yeah, dude, we've got a, we've got a lag going on too. So Google's, I don't know, maybe they're busy tonight or something. But I don't know. It's not coming back on at all. Uh, we'll shake fist and anger on Google <laughs> with free <laughs> podcasting software. Just because it's free, it still should work. <laughs> all right, we love uh, Google. <laughs> Please sponsor us. Okay, so. Well, you mentioned the, Microsoft. You're ruined now, so. Oh, I know, huh? I take it back. Well, that's why I didn't work for Microsoft. Is uh, I was a big fan of Google. Because your uh, love for Google. <laughs> my love for Google and my wife. Whenever I don't know something, I just <laughs> ask her. So. Man, we got to move this on. Sure. So action and plotting. I'll let you kind of uh, jump on those real quick, and and uh, maybe we can handle those together, perhaps. Yeah, uh, again, one of the things I often see is there's missing actions. Something has happened, uh, instead of off stage, has happened out of book. And what the reader does then is they go, wait a minute, uh, when did this happen? Why did we uh, uh, suddenly end up here? I don't recall reading that, and it puzzles them. It's, it's very frustrating to think you missed something. And a lot of readers will go back and look for it. And then if it's not there, uh, you've got a, a put-out reader. So we want to make sure that the action not only flows in the scene, but that one scene follows the next scene, that there's a proper setup. Uh, that's uh, often what a scene does, is it sets up the next bit of action that's coming along. Uh, and if you get them out of order, it gets really confusing too. But the, the missing uh, action is the real problem because the readers don't know what to do. They don't know why they missed it. They will assume it's them, not the author, until later. Uh, why is that gone missing now? Uh, and you need to be able to put those things back in. Uh, and another is a time fault. And see this one a lot. A, a time fault is we uh, too much happens too quickly in too short a period of time. Uh, the the classic one is uh, two characters meet in a restaurant. Sounds like the opening to a joke, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. Three people walk into a restaurant. Uh, two people meet at a restaurant. They sit down. And of course, a waiter is going to come over and bring menus. A waiter is going to bring water. Um, they sit down and they start a conversation. There are three lines into this when their meal arrives. And you're thinking, how slowly are they talking? Or how fast is that restaurant? Yeah. yeah. I don't even think McDonald's is that fast. Right. Uh, just within three lines. And it, those are what, some of the most difficult scenes to write. Is How do you carry this dialogue over a, the course of a meal and make sure that the time seems correct? We want to compress it and move on to the next thing. Uh, but that's bad because it just doesn't make sense. So you can't have a protagonist deliver one line and then the soup arrives and the other person respond to that line and the salad arrives and then the 
you know, two lines later, the main course is there. It just doesn't make sense, and it's very jarring to the mind of the reader. And that's a time fault. Uh, and the way you fix it really is, is is very easy. You just have a line or two here and there that you know they they fell into silence for a number of moments. They chatted about uh, uh, the rain falling outside. Whatever you find some reason to indicate there is a passing of time. Uh, sure. And it usually takes a line or two. Uh, to get that done, but it's very jarring if you you don't handle it correctly. Well, uh, you look at uh, Hills Like White Elephants, right? Uh, Hemingway's classic short story, um, where he's got two people having a very important conversation. It's a great study of dialogue, uh, but they're at a cafe and they're just having drinks. But you know, there's a lot of conversation in between the time uh, that waiters come and go, and and um, so there is that passage of time. But I, I also feel like a lot of this stems from uh, from good intentions. The writer understands that they need to balance dialogue and action. The writer understands inherently that you can't just carry a scene with only dialogue. So they want to put in some action beats. Um, and since they are in a restaurant, they feel like, oh, I can have the waitress come on scene for a moment or two. Um, I feel like that's an, the easiest thing to go to. So I think you're you're right. You're exactly right when you say you know plumb the depths of some smaller actions that your characters can do. Again, if you want to you know try your hand at this, put a couple characters in a car having a conversation driving. Um, there's not a lot they can do, but trying to find those moments of quiet, those moments where they're you know switching radio stations, they are reclining in the seat, they, you know, the passengers taking their shoes off and putting their feet up on the dashboard, whatever the case may be, trying to find little action beats that are going to kind of carry the conversation, allow the conversation to have space, to have time, to have some quiet. Um, and that's definitely something to kind of pay attention to in your writing for sure. Yeah, in one of my books I did something like that. I wanted to show my protagonist, uh, he's sitting in a bar but he's not a drinker and he's having to wait. Uh, for the uh, supporting protagonist to show up. And so he gets into this dialogue that he uh, he just wants orange juice, and the waitress starts giving him a bad time. This is a bar. We don't just serve orange juice. There's a little banter back and forth, and finally he says, okay, well, what kind of drink do you have that has orange juice? And she said, well, I can make a screwdriver for you. What's in that? Uh, whatever it is, it's vodka. And he said, great, I'll take one of those, but hold the vodka. And we just passed a few minutes just showing this time. It was not terribly significant, but it was setting up the scene. And um, and passing those few minutes, which were needed because I wanted her uh, to show up late. And that would be part of the dialogue a little later. So I needed reason for that. Absolutely. I like that. Uh, I'll have a, what is it, the screwdriver hold the vodka. So that's yeah. nice. Um you got the plotting as well here is another area that you look at. Right. Uh, in plotting, there should be uh, chronology. I always show plotting as a, a stair-step timeline. Uh, it's not a straight timeline. You know, like you learn in school, this is where we are, and this moves towards the future. It's a stair-step because we want to show the increase in tension and action and the problem, whatever it might be, with that. And one of the problems in uh, chronology is this issue of timing. When do things happen? Can they happen as quickly as they're shown? So in some books, everything might happen in a day, uh, or it might happen in a week, or it might happen over a number of years. But you got to get the chronology right and make sure the reader understands how things are changing. In movies, uh, they often show a change in weather. Uh, they show some change to show the passage of time. You know, a child grows up a little bit, and you can show a great deal of uh, the, the passing of time in a movie that way. It's a little more difficult in a book because you have to put it into words uh, instead of using mm -hmm. symbolism on the on the silver screen. Sure. And the second one I have on there are fact faults. Uh, try to get your facts right. Uh, now mistakes can slip into anyone. I just republished by my hands and I, I went over it again and I made a horrible mistake in it, uh, a factual error. Uh, I have no idea how I did it. And why no one caught it, and all the people who read it, no one commented on it. And I read it and I thought, no, I'm talking about something else here, and I set it up wrong, and uh, so I had to go back and, and, and change that. So you want to 
try do your best, do your research to make sure the facts are right. Because if you you're writing a scene, and they're they're sitting on the beach watching the sunrise, the beach in California watching the sunrise, then you got a problem because the sun doesn't rise in the west; it rises in the east and sets in the west. So that uh, you lose credibility right off the bat, uh, and it can happen. I I did one where I got the shuttles. Uh, you know, we lost two. Uh, space shuttles, actually I should call them orbiters, shuttle refers to the whole package, but we lost two orbiters in the lives of uh, some astronauts, and in one of my books, since both of them began with a C, I swapped them. Columbian Challenger? Yeah, and uh, somebody from NASA wrote, and very kind, told me how much they loved the book, and it was a great book, and it was a wonderful book, and by the way, you got the wrong title, uh, the wrong name on this particular <laughs> orbiter, and I thought... Mm -hmm. No, you're nuts. You're crazy. And I went back and looked, and sure enough, I did. I had swapped them. What book was that? That was um, uh, Zero G. That was the book Zero oh, okay. G. Yeah, yeah I, I got it backwards. I, uh, I have one in the bargain um, where uh, hospital scene, uh, and the nurse is pushing some sort of medication for nausea, and I got the wrong medication. I I looked it up. I thought it was correct. My mother-in-law is a nurse, um, and my wife, I think, found it, but somehow it didn't get changed in the final manuscript, or they didn't realize it until after it was published, and I was like, why, why, why after it's published, you bring this to me? I had... 114 people read this book and still like nobody catch, caught that yeah so um, always you know leave yourself notes I think a lot of times um, what is the TK that you put in, in brackets to remind yourself hey I gotta double check this research is is that how you handle it uh, yeah uh, some people do that I do that the TK believe it or not stands for to come uh, C-O-M-E it's from journalism. It just simply means I don't have enough information right now, so I'm going to come back and look at this. But since TC stands for Table of Contents, TK is uh, what they use for that. Yeah, and a lot will do that. Or just some put a note and make the note bold. Say, so come back and put in the details of this. But it's very, very easy to make those mistakes. I uh, remember reading Follett, one of Follett's books, and he, he talks about the California Gold Highway Patrol cars. Yeah, that's what I did. I said, uh, they're not gold. I've seen a gold pursuit car once, Highway Patrol, but they're black and white. Uh, right. When I was writing my first novel, uh, I was no longer living in San Diego, and uh, little did I know that they had changed the colors of the police cars to black and white. They used to be white. And uh, we caught that in time, so that wasn't a problem, but there's always a little something like that. In a, a ship possessed, that cover back there, I uh, have a couple uh, watching television before he ships off in a submarine, and this is World War II, and they wouldn't have had a television at that time. I was two years. They were watching Milton Berle. That was the problem, and I think I was two or three years early. Someone called me on it. I said, oh, don't be ridiculous. I'm not an idiot, and I went and looked it up, and it turns out uh, I am an idiot, and I didn't even remember putting that line in there. I didn't even know it was in there, uh, but it happens when you're writing your rough draft, so... Check your facts if you use beta readers, uh, as you did, which is, uh, I'm starting to see greater wisdom in now. Uh, hopefully you'll have somebody that will go, yeah, you might want to look at this and go back and check. I, I was beta reading for a, a friend of mine who's writing a, a novel that takes place in the 80s, and he's has them going to uh, Las Vegas and staying in the, uh, I think it's the Bellagio, and taking in the Penn & Teller show. And I... Kind of, a, you know, I pretty confident the Bellagio didn't exist in the '80s, nor did Penn and Teller start playing uh, uh, Vegas until I think it was the '90s. Both of those sure. started happening, so I double and they made a reference to what happens in Vegas, and I was like, okay, that ad campaign definitely was not around in the '80s. So uh, this whole Vegas thing is going to need a little bit of, of reworking. But I mean, quite honestly, Wikipedia it's not it's not super tough to double check a lot of your facts, uh, triple check them, you want to not just trust Wikipedia, but uh, resources are, are pretty easy, pretty quick to find these days, so uh, definitely want to check those as well. Uh, how about... Yeah, for the, uh, the viewers and the listeners, a beta reader, reader is somebody who reads the book before it goes off to the publisher, and uh, we get the term, it's a, it's a very new term really, we get the term from the computer industry, 
uh, for all these apps and software and stuff, there will be beta. Uh, there's there's an alpha release, and then they talk about a beta release, and that's the ones where ordinary people can get them if they want and try them out, but it's still not final. There's mistakes in it, um, and then uh, then it goes for a public release. So a lot of authors have gone to this idea of uh, of having five beta readers to go through and look for things, and it's uh, th just make sure they know what they're doing. But you want, yeah, you want to pick your readers wisely, and it, that might even warrant it, uh, a show topic in itself. But generally speaking, oh. an alpha reader reads what you're doing as you're doing it. So before, as you're writing the chapters, you're sending them to your alpha reader. Um, I don't suggest having more than one or two of those. And if you have them, they are not your beta readers because they've seen the mistakes and the, the facts will get jumbled in their minds. Uh, so if you change a scene, drop a scene uh, that causes some issues in the narration and the uh, chrono chronology of your, your novels, they may actually miss it because they'll remember the scene that you've cut. You know, um, So I think your beta readers should be different. You should have a, a finite number of them and you should pick them very, very carefully. Um, and uh, make sure that you're you're choosing the right people, and that you're not just grabbing anybody off the streets, essentially. So, uh, narration and prose are the two that we've got left. These are a little bit longer, so maybe maybe we can move through them pretty quickly here. Sure, um, and some of my favorites too. Uh, logic fault. That's where your character takes some action that just doesn't make sense. Uh, I was reading a Robin Cook novel. Robin Cook writes medical thrillers. And um, I don't remember which book it is. And I've always enjoyed his work. Uh, but part of his template is you have very educated, very smart people doing stupid things. And so this doctor decides to shimmy up a drain pipe, sneak into the killer's apartment. He knows this person's the killer. He's going to sneak in through the window, knowing he's, the guy's going to arrive pretty soon, but he thinks he can do this fast enough. And you stop and you think, you know... I don't, I don't think you get through four years of college and three years of med school and all these other things you've gone through by being an idiot. And this is really an idiot because you don't even have an exit. Um, now, I'm not putting uh, Cook down because he's written some great stuff. Coma, for example, has done some wonderful stuff. But we all make these kinds of logic faults. Another one, uh, I had a client I was I was editing for a, a publisher and uh, her main character, uh, a protagonist, has a gun and he's confronting the bad guy and they get in a fist fight and he never reaches for the gun. And so I asked him, why is he why is he going toe to toe with a guy who's half again as large as he is and is a trained killer when he's got this gun tucked in the back of his belt? And she said, I don't know how to use a gun, so I couldn't describe it. And um, I thought, well, let's do this. Let's let him take a quick punch and the. Uh, and the gun goes, it was in a parking lot, and the gun goes skittering under some car and he can't retrieve it, and that solves all your problems in, uh, in two lines. Um, but that's, that you don't leave the, the mistake there for that. So logic faults, just things that just don't make sense, and uh, you've got to fix those up. You know, and, and again, to kind of talking about characters doing things that are, you talked about the doctor making some, idi you know, some, some unwise decisions, we'll say. That's one reason I never got into Grey's Anatomy. I don't know if you watched that, and I'm sure it's got millions no, of fans, and I'll probably offend somebody, but I I watched like two episodes with my wife, and it was these were junior high students operating, like they're doing brain surgery, and like tell Billy that I like him. I'm gonna write him a note after lunch, and I'm like, what, what, what? Do you no, me? Does he like my dress? I'm like, you know what? This no, no, just I'm I'm out. <laughs> so yeah. You want to make sure your characters are acting in, in consistent ways, consistent with what they've been through in their life history. Sure. Absolutely. And yeah, and their education. And uh, that happens. I've, I have seen, I've read about, and I've seen in movies and on television, protagonists who are so stupid that when the bad guy comes along, you want to yell, she's behind the door. Um, let's, let's just get this over with. Uh, and you will lose readers. Actually, it becomes something they mock. So, oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. But if you have somebody who isn't all that bright, or is a huge risk taker, and li lives for the risk, then you you got uh, you know, something different there. You've got a reason for them doing those kinds of things. Or if there was, say, a child in danger in that room, you know, then the doctor might climb up, go through the window, 
and risk his life to save the life of the child. Now, okay, that makes sense, but there's motive for that. But just to go up there and check things out when he could just, you know, wait a little longer for the guy to leave. Absolutely. Yeah. Or call I them. agree. Call the police. <laughs> I, I had um, uh, one, of, one of the stories that I wrote, I had that, uh, I turned it into, uh, it was for a creative writing class I was in, and, and the, uh, had a, what was it, I had a, a teenage girl um, basically come home and, and everybody had vanished, and so she just like starts her life all by herself, and somebody reading it was like, D- didn't she call someone? Wouldn't wouldn't she call the police? And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess maybe she should try and call the police first. I guess that <laughs> yeah. makes kind of sense. But, yeah, definitely those are logic faults that you want to pay attention to. And a lot of times those come because we want to get our characters from point A to point B, and so we don't care how they get there. Uh, you just have to make sure that they're getting there for the right reasons right. Um, and in the right way. Other, otherwise, um, that's where I find most of the logic faults come. It's because we're trying to follow a particular outline and we haven't figured out the steps between A and B. So make sure that everything between A and B adds up as well. Right. Uh, you've got a point of view shifting here, head jumping. Yeah, this happens a lot. and and. Now, to be very honest, there's there's no law um, that has come down from on high that says that you cannot use third-person distant uh, point of view. But today, it's considered uh, really bad form. Uh, so, some will pull it off. Uh, Stephen King does it in the Dome. Um, I've seen others do it. But you know, there's he's Stephen King, and some of these others are great writers. Generally, the rule is you get one point of view at a time. You get to see through one pair of eyes at a time. If you switch and jump into someone else's head, then you put in a hiatus break. You make it clear that you're now in that person's point of view, and you're going to be reflecting that tone. And that's third person close. Uh, and more and more, it's becoming um, frowned upon to to have those very distant narrations. Though it has been done, still gets done. I uh, just want to be very careful and very consistent in it. I consider it a, a, a point of view fault myself. I try to stay away from it as much as possible. See, I, I, des- I define that differently. The third person distant, I, I, hmm. the third person close, like you say, one, one mind, one heart, you're inside one character's point of view. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, but what Stephen King does in Under the Dome is a pure third-person omniscient in which he is going from multiple points of view within a scene without the hiatus break, um, jumping from what Sally says and thinks to what Bobby says and thinks, etc. Um, when I say third-person distant, and, and it's interesting that we've kind of using these terms differently, what I mean is that um, that the the narrator is not within anybody's mind and so you don't get to see uh, what people are thinking you don't get to see what they're necessarily mm-hmm. feeling other than what is outwardly visible so I, I call third I call it third person distant or third person removed or third person like camera I've heard people call it that um, I think Orson Scott card goes that direction he shows cameras yeah yeah so just for those of you who have been listening for a while if you if you kind of heard our issue on our our episode on point of view. I didn't want that to uh, to confuse people, but you're saying third person distant, like third person omniscient. You can see into right. everyone's head, almost the the godlike perspective. The god point of view. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The god pov. The god pov. Yeah. POV. Yeah. I don't think that's going to catch on. I don't think so. <laughs> it's the last time it'll be heard. Yeah. You know, hopefully, we can hope, right? Right. So. All right, so we got continuity. I think we kind of touched on that a little bit, just making sure everything is consistent with the hair color, the eye color, the names. I mixed up a name in this latest, uh, this late, this book that I'm currently working on. I had a multiple personality character who goes by two different names, and then halfway through the book they switch. So you know, Mark has this one personality, Philip had this other personality, and then halfway through the book they got switched. I don't know how that happened. This is why we edit. So yeah, make... it, it happens. I did. Uh, I had the same kind of mistake in one of the uh, in the first Perry Sachs book, uh, A Treasure Deep, and he has a secretary. And I went back and changed her name in every place but one, right at the end. Mm. And I think I missed it because uh, I did a global search. I think I missed it because I didn't allow for an apostrophe s. 
so I can't remember if her last name was Brown or something, but you know, I, I searched for all the Brown and I, I checked all of those and made sure it was correct. But I think I had a plural, I mean a, a possessive S attached to her name at the very end and it, I didn't see it and therefore we switched back to her first name. I, uh, the search and find you got to be super careful with. I did a global replace for, I had a, a, a character named Kara and a character named Erica and one of my alpha readers said, I'm getting really confused with those names. I said, you're right. They are too similar. So I'm going to change Kara to Lauren. Well, I also had an island in my fantasy. This is Hand of Adonai series called Yukara Island, but K-A-R-A, just like Kara. And so everything, the Yukara Islands all became Yuloran Islands, and uh, that didn't quite make sense. So I, I had to go back and change all those. You have to be very careful with it. I was uh, editing a nonfiction book, and the guy uh, was, uh, instead of uh, doing ETC for et cetera, which he shouldn't have been doing anyway, but he, he did it as uh, ECT, but at least he was consistent in it. So I just went through and did a global replace. Um, so instead of, it's et cetera, right, ETC? Mm -hmm. Yeah, period. Yes. Okay. So I just did a global replace and replaced all the ECTs, uh, with, with ETC, and then I began noticing words like respect and other things like that were all messed up. Um, and and the reason is that those three letters appeared inside other words, and uh, I I increased my workload quite a bit because yeah sometimes you cannot unscramble the egg. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to be you want to think those things through before you do yeah, replace them all. Uh, yeah, Def definitely want to pay attention to those for sure. Yeah. All right, now uh, we're getting into, well, let's, before we jump into word choice, because for me that's kind of a prose issue, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, the authorial intrusions, the narrator intrusions, um, and the stating the obvious, I think, and the contrivance. Maybe we can touch on those, because I, I think the word choice and the awkward sentencing and all that kind of stuff kind of goes under prose as well, and so maybe we that's can fine. kind of talk about some global things there. Yeah, that's uh, that. That's fine. Um, which one did you want to look at? Let's look at the intrusions, the authorial intrusions, and the narrator intrusions. Yeah, there's a tendency as as writers to want to put ourselves in our books, and if we don't put ourselves in as characters, and that's always a bad idea to do, um, we end up putting our voice in. And sometimes mm -hmm. uh, I'll see authors go off on some kind of tangent, and you know, take a couple of paragraphs. Uh, and it's not in anyone's voice, so it has to then be the uh, the author who's forcing the uh, the information onto the page. And in novels, that's just wrong. Nonfiction, that's what you're doing. But in novels, uh, it's all through your characters. Uh, the author does not matter. The author should always disappear uh, behind the story in, in fiction. Narrator intrusion, they used to do this all the time. Um, and my, my favorite one was, it was a dark and stormy night or something like that, and a man's walking in the rain, and he sees a light in a house on a hill, and he walks towards it and knocks on the door. Little, little did he know, dear reader, what waited him beyond those large oak doors. Okay, that's that's narrator intrusion. That's the narrator saying, oh, this was a bad decision, and you need to know that reader. Well, the reader's pretty much got it figured out <laughs> that this may not be good. Yeah, and again, that breaks the fictive dream, doesn't it? I mean, it, it reminds you that you're you're reading uh, rather than um, preserving the fictive dream. Interestingly enough, Kurt Vonnegut Jr. was a huge fan of breaking this rules to the point he was very metafiction to the point in one of his novels, he sits down at a bar and observes his protagonist, and then he gets chased by a Doberman Pinscher. Like that happens. So, uh, you know, he, but you're Kurt Vonnegut, so he he made a living breaking the rules, but. Yeah, um, and how many other kind of, writers got away with that? Yeah, I think it comes back to uh, I'm not Kurt Vonnegut, so uh, yeah, and th this is true. That in many of these, you can bend these rules, but it's it's a dangerous thing to do, especially if you're not a published author and you don't have the cachet to get you through it, where you can argue with the editor and and say, now nah, you're nuts. Uh, this is the way it's going to be, uh, and very often they will give you what you ask, but uh, you got to think of the reader in all of that. so And Clive Custler's famous. I uh, used to love reading Clive Custler, uh, but he's famous for putting himself in, in his books. 
Yeah. And uh, he becomes, as we'll talk about, a contrivance in a little bit. His character is sometimes a contrivance, somebody who comes around just at the right time to save Dirk Pitt and all his buddies or whatever the who's ever with him so they can go on with the rest of the story. So if you read them, he's he's been in the factory, he's been a desert rat searching for gold, he's been all these different things. And it's it's a wink at the reader. And it, in his case, he could pull it off. It's kind of fun. I got to where I started looking for him. It's, mm -hmm. it's Alfred Hitchcock appearing in his movies, you know, stepping off a bus or something like that. It's um, it's Stan Lee in every Marvel film ever created. Almost every one, yeah, that, that's right. And you start looking for that, but as a rule, you want to stay away from it. Yeah, yeah. There's the question is if you're going to do it, why why are you doing it? We talked about that last week with breaking the rules, and so always got to be a compelling reason why. And so for the most part, there's not. And if there's not, then just don't do it. But if there is a compelling reason, you know, sure, knock yourself out. But Mm -hmm. Like you say, contrivance is kind of the deus ex machina uh, where it just... I would refer to a contrivance or a deus ex machina as essentially the, anybody or anything solving the conflict other than the protagonist. When the protagonist plays no role in solving the problem, for me that's kind of a deus ex machina. Um, I enjoyed the first Aragon book but every, because in the first Aragon book he actually does something. In the succeeding three books... Uh, everybody else fixes his problems. All he does is make things worse. And it got really tiring and really irritating for me as a reader. Like, I, I want you, you know, to eventually become something really cool and actually take care of it. But, like, legitimately, the only thing he ever beats is a giant slug. Like, he's so awesome. He beat a giant slug and he's lost every other battle he's ever been in. So that seems kind of lame. So, you know, avoid those contrivances. Let your protagonists solve their problems. I think that's a big thing to kind of look for. Yeah, tell the, the listeners or the viewers what the deus ex machina. So the deus ex machina, I, I want to say it's German, meaning machine of the gods. Um, and I, I'm not sure if it's actually German it's, or not. Uh, it's Latin, yeah. It's Latin, okay. I, I, can't, I can never remember if it's... If it's Latin or German, I always get those mixed up. But uh, Machine of the Gods, and essentially it's it's when you've got uh, an ending, uh, an unsatisfying ending that is, uh, it, it's contrived. It's, it's unbelievable. It stretches the imagination. Some of the examples I give from popular writers, uh, Edgar Allan Poe in The Pit and the Pendulum has his character falling backward into the pit of despair as... The walls of his prison are closing in and heating up to oven temperatures, and they are inches from him. And as he starts to fall backward into the pit, somebody grabs his hand. Just all of a sudden, somebody's in there, and the walls are moving back, and he's saved. The end. So, wait a minute. There, were, you were alone in the room. There's, there's no room for anybody to come into this room. You already established there were no windows, no doors. There's no way out. Like, how did this happen? Deus Ex Machina, Machine of the Gods. Um, there I was, surrounded by the enemy with a rock, a slingshot, and a million German soldiers pointing their guns at me, and then aliens abducted them all and let me go on my way. Wait, what? Aliens? Where did the aliens come from? That's a Deus Ex Machina. It's when something outside of the story comes in and solves the story. Yeah, I had to go back and double check. It is Latin. I, I suddenly started to... Uh... Because some of it's very similar to Greek, so I thought, oh boy, did I just make a fool of myself? Uh, but I didn't. I am now, but uh, at that moment, I wasn't. It normally refers to uh, supernatural uh, intervention. Though it's come to mean anything that suddenly comes in and solves the problem for you. Now, I did it in one book, uh, but the story demanded it, and I don't plan ever to do it again, uh, where there's a resetting of time. Uh, you know, so you, you can get away with it, they'll buy it, but boy, you don't want to be known for trying to solve all your problems by having um, God step in. And this is this is interesting, this is one of the great paradoxes of writing. I write primarily for the Christian market, right? And you, you cannot use uh, God as a device or a solution to the problem. Which, because you know... It Deus <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, but this is really God, so it should Which, count. You would I've think in this particular genre, yeah, that you could, but, you know, in most cases, it's still considered bad form, so. 
I've got a little one in the bargain. It's a little one, but uh, you know, it's it felt a little contrived, and I felt a little bit guilty for letting it stay in there. But it's, I think it's better than what say Dean Koontz did in the second Odd Thomas book, which is uh, Forever Odd, where you know he's got some random black panther in a burned down casino in the middle of the Mojave Desert that just randomly jumps on the villain right before she can pull the trigger. Oh, I'm sorry, spoiler alerts, by the way. And then there's an even worse one immediately following that. He's got two Deus Ex Machinas at the end of one book. Two. Two. So I, I don't I don't know what to uh to what to say with that except like how do you how did you get away with that? But you know, I, I think with some of these we show that you can get away with, but I think probably what we ought to be saying is if you're gonna use one of these devices that we're telling you not to use, make sure you do it very well and you have a really good reason to do it. Mm-hmm. And no other way around it. I think that's the big deal. We, you've heard the expression painting yourself into a corner or writing yourself into a corner. Um, and everybody says, oh, I've, I've written myself into a corner. There's no way out. I have to use deus ex machina. Well, the thing with writing is you can kind of go back and unpaint some stuff. <laughs> like that, Isn't that what editing is? It's unpainting a little bit. We have that advantage. So let's go ahead and use it. Um, one of the, uh, the Mary from Writing Excuses, I can't remember her last name, I'm so embarrassed right now, uh, talks about um, when she finds herself in that situation where her characters need something to get out of a sticky spot and they don't have it, she just, on the revision, she just gives it to them, lets them you know, use this thing to, to solve the problem and then makes sure that when she goes back in revisions that they have a good, valid reason for having that particular thing with them at that particular time. And then it's not Deus Ex Machina; it's foreshadowing. Hmm. There's a difference. So yeah. I I like that. I like that when you find yourself in that situation. What's the smallest thing you can give them that's going to have the largest payout? So that's one thing to to look for there with uh, Deus Ex Machina and contrivance. So we are rapidly running out of time, but I oh, think yeah, we're up against it, aren't we? I actually think we are pretty much out of time because you know we are. Let me out just of time. run these on the on the pros. Uh, and are we able to put this in show notes? Yeah, I can do this in show notes. Um, I can also reference uh, a uh, the sneaky pros killers episode that we did some months ago. Uh, okay. If you haven't had a chance to listen to it, that covers quite a few of these. Quite a few of these. Yeah. The plenism. I'll tell you what it doesn't cover real quick. Maybe we could just touch on that like for two seconds. But I think the biggest things uh, that it doesn't cover is the plenisms and the tautologies, which are actually very similar, but they're also very intelligent sounding and might be answers to some Jeopardy questions. That's right. That's so you right. want to you want to lay that on our listeners there, the plenism and the uh, the tautology. Well, I'll do this one very quickly. Really, what all this is about is is cleaning out the clutter. Uh, Zinzer, William Zinzer, who wrote a book about how to write nonfiction, has a great section on, on clutter, and uh, he's got images in the book um, of his second draft of the book he, that you're reading that he wrote, showing how much stuff he was able to take out, even though he'd been through it several times. And this was his formal second draft, I think it was, with that. So the clutter is just using more words than are necessary to get the idea across. Um, it's verberia. And so it's considered that the best writing is clutter-free. It doesn't have to be sparse. You just want everything to have a purpose for being there. You don't want to have an extra brick in your brick wall. And so these break down into uh, several types. One's a pleonasm. That's... Uh, P-L-E-O-N-A-S-M. That's just a fancy way of talking about unnecessary words such as she blinked her eyes. Well, what else would she blink? We don't he have anything else to blink. to his feet. He stood to his feet as opposed to standing to his elbows. Mm -hmm. And that's the test. You do the as opposed to. So she blinked her eyes as opposed to blinking her ears. Well, that makes no sense. So since there's nothing else to blink, she, she just blinked. And these sneak into everyone's writing. They're just, in every book you read, you'll see some of these. But you try to knock down as many as possible. Another is called a tautology. Not to be confused with the philosophy term. A tautology is saying the same thing twice uh, using different words. A free gift. All gifts are free. Okay, so saying a free gift is just redundant. Uh, and so you try to take those kinds of things out and, and watch for them. Again, uh, we're talking about clarity, so you, uh, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna end up with constipated writing. 
which is just too much. And the, the overarching term is uh, prolix, which is just overwriting using unnecessary words. Turgid writing is where, and I like I love the definition of this. It's swollen prose. It's yeah. overwritten. It's bombastic. You know, uh, purple prose is similar. Use that term earlier, and it's just flowery, flowery, overly descriptive kinds of things. And then the other thing you can do is get rid of unneeded attributions. Those are not the kiss of death. They're not evil. But uh, if you can get by without a, a dialogue tag, he said, she said, um, then your your stuff's going to be a little, a little stronger. Yeah, prolixity is really this overly academic kind of writing where you want to show off how smart you are, so you're going to use as many big words as possible. Um, very much describes my writing style when I first started out I wanted to demonstrate how you know the expanses the vast expanses of my you know <laughs> vocabulary horizons and I remember reading uh, Stephen King's on writing and he said hey don't ever use a big word that a small word can take the place of like whatever word comes to your mind first is probably the word you want to use uh, I think the way he says it is is um, use the vocabulary you have and make no efforts to expand it beyond what it currently is. The word you think of first is the word you want to use. And I I, ooh, I had some issues when, when I read that. I had some issues. Stephen King, yeah, what do you know about writing? Stephen <laughs> King, um, apparent, turns it out, he knows quite a bit. And uh, right. yeah, going back like and... Topics or not, that's one thing, but you can't fault his writing yeah. uh, very much. Uh, you know, he, he stretches his elbows in areas that most of us would be uncomfortable in, but... Yeah, that's uh, uh, Mark Twain said that never. I think it was never use a twenty-five cent word when a five cent word will do. Mm -hmm. uh, and Al's axiom number one: never ever try to sound like a writer. If you're trying to sound like a writer, then you're doing it wrong. You're trying too hard. Yeah, especially in the, fiction. You don't matter. The story matters. The professional athlete doesn't try to portray himself as a professional athlete. He is a professional athlete. Right. You know, he just goes out and makes the plays. And if he's making the plays, he's the athlete. You're a writer. Just go out and write. Don't try and call attention to it. Um, don't, you know, sit. And again, the problem with prolixity is the fact that you're calling attention to yourself and you're breaking the fictive dream. If you're reminding the reader that they are reading, you have violated the first, I think, one of the first rules of fiction, which is let the reader experience it and that you know provide that as John Gardner said that real and fictive dream keep it unbroken um, and if your vocabulary is is distracting from that then you're breaking that fictive dream uh, if they have to stop and Google all you know every third word um, they don't think wow this guy's really smart they think this guy's super pretentious uh, and that's not the uh, the image that you want to portray for yourself the lesson I learned the hard way by the way so um, so excellent. I will put all these on the show notes, uh, but we have exhausted our time, and I thought we had some uh, some really cool things. So of course we always miss something. So if you want to, you know, leave a comment with your favorite editing tip, we'd love to hear it. Uh, Pops, how can they get in touch with you? Well, even though my lower third disappeared for some reason, um, you can reach me at altingansky.com, and from there you can really. Uh, skip over to the Blue Ridge site uh, which is the writers conference site or you can see my books there that's you can you can get a lot of places from there so just altongansky.com and uh, of course I'm on as Alton Gansky I'm on Twitter and I'm also on Facebook uh, I'm on Twitter and Facebook as well at Adi Gansky uh, AaronGansky.com bottom portion of my screen as you can see it's probably the best way to get a hold of me uh, to get all our podcasts in the past is the best episodes etc uh, so that's where you guys can find all that great information so thank you all for listening and until next week good writing <laughs>